Yeah, sorry, I forgot. I had to record that. But either way, what did we say? Good living group, good asset, and a base. There we go, yes. Those were your three signs that you're going to do your WAS reaction. Remember that if you're doing an intermolecular version of the same reaction, you're going to form something that's cyclic. If not, it's just going to be pure linear. But do we have any questions from last session on the mechanisms? Okay, looks like we're good. Now, specifically, let's focus on our epoxides. We know how to make them. Now we have to learn how to break them. Now, remember that epoxides were really reactive. What was the reason? Because of the ring strain, exactly. Meaning that these guys can be cleaved in both acids and bases. Okay, they're highly reactive because of that. Now, we already know the acid ranking. What was the ranking again? Three, one, two. And then just in case, this was for Dr. West. And then for Dr. Roche. Three, two, one. Again, do not ask me the reason behind that. No idea. At this point, I'm not going to argue with your professors, but the new ranking is for base cleavage. For base cleavage, it's actually very simple. It's just going to be one, two, three. Primary, secondary, and then tertiary. And that's going to be for both professors, so it's easier. Okay. So far, we're just filling out information before we talk about the actual mechanism. Okay, are we ready to see some examples? Okay, looks like we're ready. Okay, let's start with this first one. Now, for your epoxide, sometimes you're gonna be given stereochemistry, okay? Now, remember the two main steps of breaking epoxides or breaking any ethers. We have a nucleophilic attack and we have an acid-base reaction. Nucleophilic attack specifically is gonna be like an SN2 reaction, so we flip. So a little rule that we're going to keep in mind throughout all of the problems we're going to do is that if you cleave, you're going to flip. Okay, I want you to keep that in mind. If you cleave, you flip. Now, usually your professor doesn't focus that much on stereochemistry, but just in case, just keep that in mind. But again, let's go through this problem. So first of all, what kind of um, catalyst are we using? An acid or a base? Base. Okay, let's talk about that before. For that, let's look at the three problems at once, okay? I want you to notice something in the arrows. Whenever you see H plus or HA, either at the top or at the bottom of the arrow, that indicates that whatever alcohol you're given is acting like an acid. So the first two are an acid cleavage. But the very last one, we don't see H plus or HA. Plus also, let's notice something. We have sodium in here. So what's going to happen in there? It goes away and we're left with our negative charge. So this guy is going to be a base cleavage. Okay, That's how you're going to know if it's an acid or a base cleavage. Just look at what you're provided in the arrow. And that's it. Now, let's go back to our original problem in here. Okay. So, from the previous SI session, how did we start the mechanism for breaking ethers? We protonated the oxygen so we can make it into a better leaving group. So, we're simply doing an acid-base reaction. Meaning that your second step, that's gonna be your nucleophilic attack. Okay. Now, my oxygen is just gonna gain one of those hydrogens from the alcohol group. So now we're gonna end up with practically the same molecule, but this time my oxygen is gonna have a positive charge, making it into a better leading group. Okay, so far we're good. Simple as that. We're just adding a little hydrogen. That's it. Now, keep in mind 
at this point, because my alcohol group lost one hydrogen, I have my conjugate base of that guy, which is just H3O minus, okay? Let's just keep track of everything in there, okay? I have my good leaving group now. What was the next step? What am I gonna do? Nucleophilic attack, where? So yes, before you even do your nucleophilic attack, that's when we use the ranking that we were talking about. So remember for that, we're looking at the carbons directly connected to the oxygen. The one on the left side, the first one is just Primary, remember bond to oxygen doesn't count as an R group. Second one has three connections to carbon, so it's tertiary. So if it's an acid cleavage, this is gonna be my ranking. So that means that I'm gonna be cleaving the tertiary one, okay? So now I'm gonna have my oxygen hanging around from the primary one. Now, keep in mind, if I'm losing one bond, I'm going from sp3 to sp2. So there's no stair chemistry at this point because there's a little carbocation in there. So, so far, we just have a little positive charge in that tertiary one, okay? It just lost one bond. It has a positive charge. There's no stair chemistry because I don't have four groups. Because if we're breaking the bond here, from the tertiary carbon, that means that this whole portion is gonna be hanging from the primary one. Because of the ranking that we're using for acid cleavage. Because specifically we're using an acid, we know that our preference is to break something that's tertiary over something that's primary. And then last one is the secondary one. Okay, so far questions on this. We're good, makes sense? Okay, now, is that gonna be my product? How am I gonna neutralize it? With the H plus? If the H plus comes back, is it somewhere? Is somehow going to get attached there? No. So what's going to do the nucleophilic attack? Mm -hmm. The alkoxide that we deprotonated, remember? So in this case, my oxygen is just going to get connected there on my carbocation. That's it. I still have my alcohol group on my primary carbon. On the tertiary one now, I have that new connection to the alkoxide. But remember, specifically, we cleave something in that carbon. So we have to show that change of stereochemistry. chemistry. So that new bond that I'm making is going to be on a wedge. So it's going to be oxygen with one carbon chain. And then the methyl group is going to be on a dash now. Because if we notice, our initial methyl group was on a wedge, but now it's on a dash. So that's showing the nucleophilic attack in a way. Okay, so far, questions on that? Make sense? Yes. Technically, you can do it um, with a nucleophilic attack. The only reason why I try to separate them is so everyone can see clearly why we're using that ranking and when specifically. So technically, yeah, the nucleophilic is what triggers the breakage. But questions so far? Very good. Remember, you're not going to get tested on the actual mechanism. You just want the products. That's it. OK, can I get a volunteer for the second one? Okay, we're volunteering someone. 
Okay, let's give it a try. <laughs> Very good. There you go. Okay, so in this case, we know that we're doing an acid cleavage, again, because that H plus was given on the arrow. Now we have a pretty good leaving group because remember that the oxygen on the epoxide attacked the alcohol group. Now we can check our ranking. Exactly, we're gonna cleave the tertiary one over the primary one. So, so far, carbocation on the tertiary one and your alcohol group in there on the primary one. So let's just neutralize everything with the alkoxide that we created. And exactly, we're showing the change in stereo chemistry because of the nucleophilic attack. We end up with a little ether and an alcohol group. So yeah, great job. Okay, questions on that one. Mechanism-wise, it's the same thing that we just did. Do we need a few minutes to write down the mechanism? Yes, okay. Seems like there's a lot of hinders, right? Like the oxygen. Is that stable or relaxed? Technically, no, because one of them is going towards the back, the other one towards you. So the carbon cleave is always going to turn to a carbocation. For the base, same steps, but this time the order is going to be backwards. Okay, are we ready for the last one? Do we need one more minute? One more minute, that's okay. But actually, if you're already done, give it a try to the last one. This time it is a base cleavage, so slightly different, but I gave you the specific order of the steps. This time for base cleavage, the steps are inverted. So we start with a nucleophilic attack, we end with acid base. So just give it a try, see what happens. We got stuck on the last part. Just remember, if it's backwards, start looking at the ranking first, cleave, connect something, and then just make everything neutral. Best try. If you want, I can give you a little piece of paper so you can write it here. I don't know if you want to do it on your notes or just give it a try here on a scratch paper. So.
your father. He is, you know, and and he he has the best intentions for you. His yeah. plans are to prosper you. Yeah. For he's to an expected end, but your life does not. Oh my God. Prosper you. Yeah. Brings to an expected end, but your life does not. Oh my god. If you god. have a question, just type it on the chat because we can't hear you. My god. Okay, did anyone give it a try to the very last one? Yes. Okay, Nancy, go for it. Oh, sorry, it's a highlighter. <laughs> Nancy, so far you're doing good for an acid cleavage. If it's a base cleavage, same steps but backwards. We first start with a nucleophilic attack. So for that, you first have to start looking at the ranking of the carbons. So look if we have a primary, secondary, tertiary. The one's primary, you cleave it there, yes. Specifically, we know that sodium goes away, right? And you're left with a negative charge. That oxygen attacks the primary carbon. And one little methyl group. Yeah, you got it. His steps are a little different, yeah. As long as you get the answer, you're good. As long as you get the answer, you're good. And actually, after we're done with the mechanism, we're going to see a little shortcut again. But so. Oops. Okay. First of all, did anyone get the same product that Nancy got? Mm -hmm. We all got it? Did anyone not get the product? Okay. Seems like no one, which is good. But let's look at the mechanism for this little guy in here. So since we know that this third, the steps are inverted, again, I just start by looking at the degree of the carbons that I have. Left one, it was tertiary, right one, primary. So we know that sodium goes away. You're left with a pretty good nucleophile that's going to attack the primary carbon. It gets connected there, and then we're going to break it open for that reason. So, so far we have the oxygen minus hanging from the tertiary one. And we have the primary one with a little carbocation at this point. Sorry, with a, with a connection to my ether. And then to just make everything neutral, because pretty much we already have the product, that oxygen just needs to grab a hydrogen from the solvent. So that's how we end up with this guy in here. And that's it. Questions? So you don't think it's no. 
remember that you're always going to get some sort of byproduct. Which in lab, they're more important. Yes, you should keep track of them. But in lecture, not that much. Yeah. Okay. When did you do the chemistry at the attack step? At this guy, because it's a nucleophilic attack. You remember, this is the point where? Mm hmm. Yes. So we need to show yeah yes yes there's the change to their chemistry and actually let me just highlight it for you there we go there's our change i mean both terms work yeah okay Questions on cleaving epoxides. Pretty much the same steps, but remember, the ranking for bases is slightly different. Okay. We're good to move on to IUPAC at this point. Mm -hmm. Do we need one more minute to finish writing down our notes? Or we're good. One more minute? Or we're good. I just see yeses, but for which one? <laughs> One more minute, okay. <laughs> Okay, we're good? Okay. Let's talk about crown eaters now. Usually this is everyone's favorite question because it's simple as just counting. Now, from lecture, do you guys remember how to name crown eaters? Say that again? Exactly, yeah. That's pretty much it for crown eaters. So for crown eaters, you're pretty much always going to have initial number, crown, second number, ether. Now, those two numbers are important. They're relevant for the specific molecule. So let me do a little diagram in here. Crown, number, ether. Now, the first one is going to be the biggest number that you're going to get. Next one is going to be the smallest one. And each one of those is going to be related to atoms in that specific molecule. Now. The first one, it's the number of carbons and oxygens that you have. No hydrogens, just carbons and oxygens. Then the small one is just the number of oxygens. So for example, if we start with the metal one, what's going to be the name of that molecule? 12 crown, 4 ether. 12 crown, 4 ether, exactly. For the first one, again, this is the number of carbons and oxygens. Four is just the number of oxygens that he have. Bless you. On the left side, what's the name? 21 crown, 7 ether. Very last one. 18 crown and 6 ether. So yeah, it's just counting. Question? Yes. So yes, the, some students point that out to me. As long as you count the number of oxygens that you have, if you multiply by three, you can get the big number really fast instead of just counting each of the atoms individually. So just count the number of oxygens that you have, 
multiply by three, that's your number. So let's just do this. The big number comes from the small number times three. And that's that. That's all you have to do for crown eaters. And there's only going to be one question on crown eaters. So, yeah, I know. Everyone's favorite, but doesn't get tested as much. But okay. That's our new a specific kind of eaters. Now let's just talk about our normal eaters. So for that, we're going to go to the very beginning of the handout, page one. Because we skipped that part initially. Okay. Now, for ethers, there's going to be two different ways. One of them is the one that we already talked about in the West reaction when we form diethyl ether, right? We remember that portion a little bit? Okay. Now, that one is when the ether acts as your pairing chain. But then we can also have a second scenario in when your ether is going to be a substituent. So pretty much whenever your ether doesn't have any sort of branching, pretty much everything is just taken out of your oxygen just linearly, that's going to be when it's going to act as your parent chain. So on the left side, to do that, remember, the name of your parent chain was very simple. It was just ether. So this guy again, this is just your parent chain. So now we just have to figure out what carbon chain specifically we have on the left and the right side. So on the left side, this guy, that benzene, how do we call that substituent? Mm -hmm. This guy is your phenyl group. And then what about this one carbon chain? Methyl. Okay, now, remember that IUPAC is by alphabetical order. So what's the full name? There we go. Methyl, phenyl, ether. That's it. You just need to name your carbon chains and there would eat there. That's it. Now, the difference with the second one is that we have some sort of branching out in this guy. So we can see how we have my main ether here, but it's two connections. But on top, we have this whole long carbon chain. So for that, we're just going to start naming the longest carbon chain. So in this case, how many carbons do you see? And what's the name of that one? It's just pentane because we just have five. One, two, three, four, and five. And let's just start with pentane. Okay. Now, from lecture, do you guys remember the prefix for um, ethers? Alcoxy. Sounds similar. Oxy. It's just oxy. It's just oxy. Exactly. In this case, whenever you eat there's some citron, instead of saying eat there, we just say oxy at the very end. But we have to be specific about that because I still need to name the carbon chain connected to the other side of the oxygen. So it should be the same methyl. But this time, it's going to be remethoxy. Again, it's oxy because of this. And that's it. Those are the two main ways in which you need to name ethers. Now, mostly you're going to get tested on the left side on when your ether is your pairing chain. Um, but the reason why I show you the second one in where it's where you have to use the oxy ending is because you might see those names in practice problems. Okay, sometimes the molecule is not going to be given out, drawn out to you, so you need to figure it out just based on the name. So do you have any questions on IUPAC so far? We're good? Make sense? Okay. Now, pretty much, don't pack your stuff yet. Pretty much, concept-wise, we are done. Last thing that we have to check for this chapter is multi-step synthesis. Okay, and that's not everyone's favorite. So let's go to the very last page now. Now, at this point, we've learned 
so many reactions, so it's going to be fair game to show any of them in any order that he wants for your exam or quizzes. So let's just start looking at the simple one, the one that has only three reagents. So whenever you have to do any multi-step synthesis, first just identify what kind of reaction you're doing. Simple as that. So you know what kind of change needs to happen. So PBR3, what is that? SP3? SN2? That's the mechanism that it follows, but what kind of reagent is it? Protecting groups, exactly. Specifically, it was from group one, the one that does SN2. So very good. Okay, so this guy is a protecting group specifically. Well, this is not group. From group one, which means that it's SN2 and you flip the stereochemistry. Okay, next one, magnesium and ether. What kind of reaction is that? Grignard or how to make your Grignard? Oh, how, how to make the Grignard specifically. So this one is making your Grignard. And then very last one, just by looking at the actual reagent that we're given in here, we're not given, it's not gonna be a base per se. We we can't really tell what kind of reaction we're doing, but if we see that we are making the greenish reagent and then we see a carbonyl group, what's gonna be, what's gonna happen? Is it gonna be an oxidation? If you start with a greenish reaction, you form your greenish reagent, and then your next step is to react with a carbonyl group what kind of reaction is that? Don't say Grignard's reaction. It's the specific type. We have oxidation and we have reduction. Okay. So in this case, everything is given in a planar view so you don't have to show the change in stereochemistry. So for product A so far, how is going to be my product? How is it going to look like? You replace the OH with a VR, with a little bromine. So same molecule, but now we have a little bromine. Okay, beautiful. Now, we have the reagents to make our greenest reagents. So we know that for that, we're pretty much just inserting the magnesium in between carbon and bromine. That's it. Oops. Now, to make it active, I know that magnesium and bromine need to go away. So I'm left with the actual nucleophile in here. Okay, now at this point, it should be the same thing that we just learned, reductions. Can I get a volunteer for this portion? You can look at your notes. And let's not repeat the same volunteer, so not, don't look at her. Victims? Give it a try. Beautiful, we attack the delta positive, kick up the electrons so we don't break the poor octet in there. You're good so far, I'm just walking through the mechanism. You're good, just keep going. We have it a little Bring in there, yes. Oxygen minus. Then we reform double bond, so we kick out our leaving group. Exactly.
now we have a little ketone, exactly. And now the rest of our carbons follow. That happens sometimes, you're good. And there's our little leaving group. Perfect. Exactly. Because remember, for reductions, we need to get rid of every pi bond that you see. Nucleophilic attack, kick up the electrons. And now we're not going to have any more double bonds. Beautiful, so now we only have to make everything neutral. So that's when our water comes into play. In this case, we were given water, okay. so. Mm -hmm. And there we go. We have our alcohol group. So great job. You got it. Question. You mean this one? So that one, it's your little nucleophile from Grainiers. Yes. But in this case, remember, Esther specifically, they have a leaving group. So you're going to assume that you have enough amount to repeat the reaction all over again. That's why you need at least two moles of that nucleophile because we need to do the nucleophilic attack all over again because of the reforming of the double bond. Okay, so far, questions. Did it make sense? We're good? Okay. Now, can I get a volunteer for the next multi-step synthesis? This time, no guidance. Chris. Absolutely not. Absolutely not. You can choose a volunteer. Go for it. You know that I would pick man. No. <laughs> Actually, you're just one, so you can choose your next volunteer. You get to choose someone, anyone you want. Except Chris, Except Chris yeah. He just plainly refused. We don't know how to get started. Why don't we just start discussing it as a group first? It doesn't look that scary at first. Okay, so let's just do that. Let's just look at the reagents and see what happens. So we have green yards. Okay, now next reagent is, what was the name of this guy? Epoxide. So usually with epoxides, if we have them, remember, they are very reactive. So most likely we're going to end up leaving it open. So... Let's just cleave or epoxide in this case, in that step. And then we ju we're just given water with H3O plus. So that just looks like it's going to protonate something. That's it. It's just going to be a protonation of some sort. Okay, so we have the three main steps. So let's just look at this portion. That's it. We have a ketone carbon chain with a triple bond, and we have green yards. So what's going to happen in here? Walk me through the mechanism. Why the one in the triple bond? Why can I just attack this carbon in here? 
You are correct. But what was the reasoning behind it? Because it's an acidic hydrogen. Remember, terminal triple bonds, these guys are very acidic. So remember, whenever you have anything acidic, that overrides your reduction. So we just need to take away that hydrogen and we're gonna end up with the same molecule, but this time at the very end, we're gonna have a little lone pair with, an, with a negative charge, okay. So if we have a carbon chain with a negative charge, this one, it's pretty much a good nucleophile or a base. We can work with both. Most specifically, our next reagent is an epoxide. So we're gonna cleave it open in a base. What was the ranking for base cleavage? It was just one, two, three. Okay, now, so to do that, remember, I need to look at my carbon's directly connected to the oxygen. So left one, what's the degree? Primary, because connection to oxygen doesn't count. What about the right one? Which one are we gonna cleave, left or right? Left side, exactly. So we know that my base slash nucleophile is gonna attack on my primary carbon and that's how that bond between carbon and oxygen gets broken. So at this point, we're having the same carbon chain. And then let's just keep track of our carbons in here. Oops. This was the primary one. And this was the secondary one. Okay, I just connected it. Because remember that's a nucleophilic attack, so both molecules get combined. So very last step, what happens? Protonation, I'm just gonna add a little hydrogen in there so everything is neutral, simple as that. So this oxygen is gonna grab one of those hydrogens. And at the end, we end up with an alcohol group in here. And that's that. Yes. So that ketone didn't get reduced because remember, greenness was a very picky reagent. It can do a reduction, yes. But as soon as you see anything acidic at all, like alcohol groups or any terminal triple bonds, those guys are going to be very acidic. So they're going to override the reduction. They're just going to allow for the acid base reaction to happen. Yes, in the back first. It can be either or. That happens with Grainers, only with Grainers. That guy was very picky. We knew that it was a base because of the negative charge. So pretty much bases, negative charge, acids, positive. So. We were just looking at this portion. So we were just looking at the epoxide and the little terminal triple bond with the negative charge. I wasn't looking at the H2O or H3 plus. So yeah. Because in this case, remember, I'm not looking at every single step at once. So a lot of students get confused with this portion. You're not looking at that yet. You're looking at what you're given so far, which is this guy. Usually bases are gonna be, are gonna tend to have a negative charge, acids tend to have a positive charge. No, no, no opposite. Bases and nucleophiles, negative. Acids, positive. Okay, do not mix them up. Wait, so 
Chris, you go first. How, how did you choose which carbon to attach to the alkyne? To the alkyne, because of the ranking that I was just using. So I know that it was primary, secondary, and then tertiary. So that primary is going to have preference. That's why I'm attacking there, because specifically, I want to break this bond open. So that's why I need to tag there. Because if I do that, I create a new bond. So to not break the octet, you need to kick something out. So yeah. So whenever we see like a, a tertiary hydrogen, or I think that's for like a hydrogen. And a triple bond? Yeah. 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 So that's super yeah. aesthetic. So that's how we can know that it's- uh, It overrides it, yes. Yes, please. So yeah. We'll continue with the last multi step synthesis on Wednesday. So get ready for that. Give it a try on your own first, because we're gonna get volunteers Wednesday. So yeah. Wait, wait, keep it up. I'll keep it up for one second. No problem. Take care, guys. Okay. So the last one is each of the whatever reagents going to be used as one, so it can maybe be used. Yeah. <laughs> 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 <laughs>